Uh, we're going to be turning to Acts chapter 18 this morning. Um, so if you do have a Bible, it'd be great to turn there with me. Acts chapter 18. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'll read through the passage. We'll pray together just that God would help us understand what we're reading. And then we'll dig in together. <coughs> so in Acts chapter 18, uh, we're going to read the first 17 verses. Um, so hopefully not take too long. But uh, let's read it together, it's beginning at verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had, or- had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. Let's pray together before we dig into the passage. Lord God, we thank you so much that you have given us your word. And we thank you that this is not uh, just like any other book, that this book is alive, that you speak actively to us through it. Lord, we thank you for the passage this morning in Acts chapter 18. We pray that you would give us understanding through your Holy Spirit, that you would help us understand what you're saying to us and that you would help us put it into practice that we might know the joy it is to follow Jesus. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I begin by asking, um, Laura's touching on it there as we were reading this morning in our, in our first couple of passages. Have you ever found yourself in a situation, whether it's at home, whether it's in, in workplace, wherever it is, where you, you think to yourself, why even bother? Why am I doing this? Uh, Maybe you're a student in school or in university and you've just opened an exam page and you're faced with a bunch of complicated questions. You think, why even bother? Um, Or you you open your inbox to hundreds of different emails. Your colleague or your friend has maybe let you down again. And you just think to yourself, "Why, why am I doing this? Why keep going? Why even bother? When you think about our spiritual lives and our walk with God, it can be a similar kind of mindset at times, can't it? To remain faithful following Jesus can be hard. It's difficult at times. When things don't seem to be letting up, when maybe in the workplace you you see colleagues who cut corners and they get recognition and they get promoted and you don't, or when you might maybe have tension between family or friends and it doesn't seem to be easing up, Or even just in our own personal walks with with Christ, sometimes it feels like we need to to gather up so much energy, doesn't it, to even open the Bible and sit down and pray. It's difficult. And sometimes even at that point of of exhaustion or discouragement, we can just think to ourselves, why why even bother? 
Why keep going on? It's difficult to remain faithful. In today's passage, in Acts chapter 18, uh, we're going to get an encouragement for the weary Christian. The the Christian who, who feels like they're maybe just receiving one discouragement after another. In Acts chapter 18, the verses 1 to 17, we are told that God will sustain his people. So take heart. Take heart. God will sustain his people. It's not all on our own shoulders. We don't have to muster up the strength. God will sustain his people. Take heart that God is with you. He will sustain you. Nothing can happen outside of God's control. We know that. So be encouraged to press on in the knowledge that he has not abandoned you. Uh, let me give you just an overview of where we are in Acts chapter 18, because I realize we're just kind of parachuting into this chapter. Um, we are rejoining Paul in his missionary journey as he um, is on the point, on the verge of even saying to himself, why even bother go on? Um, he's traveled from Thessalonica to Berea to Athens. And now we see there in the first few verses, he's arrived in Corinth. And each time, each time that he has visited, he's been met with opposition. People have not wanted to have anything to do with what he's been preaching. The message that Jesus Christ is alive, risen from the dead, he's been driven out of the town. He arrives in Corinth and again finds himself up against people who refuse to even consider his message. And he's done. He's done. He's weary, discouraged. Um, Have a look at verse 6. If you glance down at verse 6, you get an idea of where Paul is at. Verse 6. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul, in the face of another crowd of people opposing him, he said, I'm done with these people. He feels like giving up on his mission to these people and wants us to move on elsewhere. And though he's down and out, by the work of the Holy Spirit, he has given sustenance from God, strength to continue, and, and through the word of God today, we are given strength from God to press on as well. In this passage, we're going to see four ways, uh, four brief ways in which God encourages Paul to maintain going on in his, mis- in his mission. Four ways that God sustains Paul when he's, dire, when he's tired and done, wanting to move on. Four ways that God sustains Paul, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, Four ways that God can sustain us whenever we are tired or when we are discouraged. So take heart, know that God will sustain his people. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Um, The first slide, if you want to push on there, Daniel, thank you. Um, The first slide and the first point we're going to make is God sustains his people through friendships, through strong friendships. Glance down and look at the first four verses with me. Verses one to four. Um, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. As Paul leaves Athens, he meets this couple, Aquila, Priscilla, um, they're from Italy, and, and they, it turns out they actually have the same job as Paul. You see that in verses 2 and 3 there. But note the encouragement that Paul seems to draw from this friendship. He, he spends time with them daily. He works alongside them. He's talking with them. He builds a bond with them to the point where, if you glance at verse 4, verse 4, um, he can go every Sabbath to try and persuade Jews and Greeks about the risen Christ. One way that God sustains us in our discouragement and in our tiredness is through friendships. It it can seem a simple thing, but it's true. It's helpful for us. Take stock of of your life now. Take stock and consider the friendships that you are investing in. Consider your friends that God has placed around you. They're not there by accident. God has placed them there to be an encouragement to sustain you in your walk with Christ. Often we we have this kind of wrong idea of Paul. When you think of Paul, the, the missionary, we kind of think of him as this lone wolf guy, don't we? Um, he, he's, he's holed up in his office. He's studying away at his doctrine. He's got a mission to, to accomplish. He goes from town to town. He's got no time to spend and, and make friends with people. Um, but that's not actually true. 
Um, he, he depends on deep friendships with people. You think of Barnabas and Timothy and Silas, uh, these guys, Aquila, Priscilla, uh, we know of John Mark elsewhere, and later in this passage we hear of, of Paul staying with a guy called Titius Justus. God sustains us through the encouragement of brothers and sisters that he has placed in our lives for that purpose. Let's be sure as Christians, as we, as we seek to follow Christ, that we don't cut ourselves off from, from those around us, especially in times where we might feel discouraged or finding it hard to reach out to the Lord. We should be investing in good friendships. So one way that God sustains us is through friendships that he has placed in our lives. But not only that, we're going to press on and see that God also sustains us through good news. If you would flick that on, Daniel, thank you. Through good news. Um, having left Thessalonica and Athens on his way to Corinth, we read, if you look in verse 5, uh, we read in verse 5 that Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia bringing good reports uh, to Paul from another church. Um, in 1 Thessalonians, um, from Thessalonica, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, we get a little bit more information about what was this good report that was brought to, to Paul. So let me read it to you. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. Uh, Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that, you are, and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. And verse 7 as well. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. We were just thinking there about Missions Night in Balnehinch, which is online, and I encourage you to, to, to tune in online. Uh, but why do we have Baptist missions? Why do we, why do we receive mission reports from other mission organizations? Uh, why do we have WhatsApp groups to keep updated with the work of by teams and summer outreach? Uh, some of us maybe get prayer cards or newsletters of different missionaries across the world. We do that because the Lord gives us great encouragement as we hear about how he's working across the world, don't we? we we're encouraged to hear how he's using other people to persevere in preaching his word, remaining faithful. And in that, in that way, we are encouraged to remain faithful in our walk here. He sustains us as we hear of the good work he's doing across the world. Our God's big, isn't he? He's sovereign. Nothing can happen outside of his control. So take heart. I think one way that we can put that into practice in our lives um, and to be sustained through good news is by seeking to be intentional to, to know missionaries, to keep up with uh, a mission organization. Um, missionaries are not just kind of an extra thing uh, as, of, a, of a church or an association. They are part of our church together. They are brothers and sisters, aren't they? Consider the work of Baptist missions, for example, the mission department of our association of Baptist churches the association has come together to send out missionaries to the Republic of Ireland, to Spain, to France, to Peru. One way we could do that, even as a church, is to reach out to a missionary, to keep up to date with, with their work. How are they getting on? How are they seeing God working amongst the people that they're investing in? Maybe you follow along online, receive a newsletter, and be intentional to, to actually pray for the work that they're involved in. Join them in their mission in prayer. God sustains us in our discouragement as we hear good reports and good news of how he is working elsewhere in the world. So God sustains us through friendships that he has placed in our lives, sustains us through good news and good reports of how he's working elsewhere. Thirdly, though, um, we see that God sustains us through his promises. God sustains us through his promises. Uh, we're going to look down at verse 9 and um, 10. Um, against the, the opposition that Paul faces in Corinth. He wants to be done with them. Remember, verse 6, let me just read it to you. Verse 6 is how he, Paul is feeling. When they opposed Paul he, and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul's weary. He's, he's in need of serious strengthening. If you see verses 7 to 8 just afterwards, we see him stay with another friend, this is justice, uh, where God speaks and gives Paul a promise. And here is the promise. Read verses 9 and 10 with me. 
One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. God says, that first bit, God says, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Don't let fear stop you from living for Jesus. You and I both know the the strength and courage it it takes, even at times at work or in school or or even in in a shop, to muster up the courage whenever you're asked, what were you doing at the weekend? To say, oh, I was at church. Isn't it it weird that we kind of like shrink shrink back from that? But God says, "Don't, don't fear. Take heart. Keep going. Don't back off. He continues to say, for I am with you. You think of Paul moving from city to city, making friends and then having to leave those friends behind. What assurance that is for him. Is he alone as he moves on? He's not alone. You think of Isaiah 41 verse 10. God says, fear not. I am with you. I be not be, do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We're singing that, that song, um, Great is thy faithfulness. It's, it's not great is our faithfulness. We rely on the faithfulness of God, don't we, to, to strengthen us with his right hand. What encouragement to know that God is with us. The promise goes on. No one is going to attack and harm you. The Lord's protection is, is our protection. He is our strength, our shield. The God of the universe is holding us in his hands. There's nothing that can happen outside of his will. And the Lord finishes his promise by saying, because I have many people in this city. The Lord holds the future, doesn't he? We were just singing that together. He knows the hearts of those that he calls his people, his own. Take heart that we are not laboring alone in our ministry as we seek to share Jesus with our friends and with our family, as we seek to worship together. We're not alone. We're not alone as we seek to make Jesus known here, even in Brannockstown. God has many people in this place, and he holds the future. In Great Victoria Street, where we uh, worship in Belfast, we are going through Revelation at the moment um, and on Sundays. And you think of the throne room in Revelation. Can you picture it? Do you know the scene where there's a throne in the center and there's multitudes of people gathered around? Um, Multitudes that no one can number from every tribe and nation, all people, all languages. Um, They're standing before the Lamb with palm trees in hand and they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to the Lord, the God who sits on the throne. Do you know that scene? You can picture that scene. God will not cease saving sinners until everybody in that throne room has heard of the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God will not stop until everyone has heard of the freedom there is from sin, not in our own strength, but relying on the work of Jesus, who gave himself up freely, who came from from heaven to earth, that we might know joy in him, freedom from sin. So take heart. God is all-powerful, and he has many people still to come to him. And you think of Paul in his tiredness and discouragement. He gains such encouragement from this promise that if you see verse 11, verse 11, he stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God, where Paul was saying, right, I'm done, I'm moving on. After he receives encouragement from friends, from good reports, from this promise from God, verse 11, he stays a further year and a half from that encouragement. That encouragement is real for us today. Though we might be weary and discouraged and tired, feeling like we just want to throw in the towel and just move on, try something else, we know that God will sustain us. God sustains us through friendships that he has gifted to us, through good news and reports across the world and and locally, through his promises, and then finally, God sustains us through his sovereignty, through his sovereignty. Let's read the the final uh, five verses, beginning at verse 12. God sustains us through his sovereignty. Verse 12. While Gallio was pro-council of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. 
Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words, names, and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off, and then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the Peru Council. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. The Jews bring Paul before the council, testifying he's preaching something that is against the word of God. Uh, He is preaching that Jesus Christ has died and risen back to life. He is preaching there's, there's, there's freedom in Jesus Christ, this man who has defeated death. And Gallio, the Roman ruler of the province, um, through God's sovereignty, doesn't see it as a legal case and just dismisses it out of hand. What could have been a, quite a serious situation for Paul to find himself in is just dismissed out of hand by a Roman ruler. Uh, and is that just by good fortune that he, that he didn't count it as worthy of his time? No, that was God acting in his sovereignty. God is sovereign. God is mighty. Even the winds and the seas obey him, don't they? Though we see across our island, across the world, we might see corruption in governments and leaderships. We might see the word of God seemingly being stamped out and pushed to the side. We know that if what we are doing, what we believe is of the word of God, if we know we are part of God's family, as Paul says earlier in Acts, Nothing can overthrow God's plans. Nothing can stop the word of God. Nothing can derail his divine plan, not even rulers or governments. We get encouragement knowing that God is sovereign over all. He has a good plan for us. So as we close up, um, Paul, you think of Paul being called into ministry, laboring church after church, town after town, He has to make friends and leave friends, but he's not abandoned, isn't he? He's not alone. God is with him. For us, living a life following Jesus, it can be difficult. We know that. It will be difficult. Jesus himself tells us that. Paul is often opposed. He's beaten up. He's imprisoned, even. But he's not alone any of those times. The Lord sustains him. The Lord will sustain him further. And the Lord will sustain us. God sustains us. If you are feeling weary or feeling like things are difficult, just getting one discouragement after another, maybe just don't feel like we're getting anywhere with our own faith or with our witness, this passage tells us, take heart. Take heart. God will sustain you. God sustains his people. Persevere. We want to foster good friendships, don't we? We want to invest in those people that God has placed around us. We want to seek out uh, and take interest in good and encouraging news reports of his work across the world. Remember and remind yourself, believe in the promises of God that we see throughout scripture. We have a faithful God who does not change. His promises last forever and trust in his good sovereignty. God is over all. We can rest that he has a good plan. When we Don't understand it. We know he is good and above it all. God will sustain his people. Let's take heart that he is a good God. Let me pray to close and I'll pass over to Laura. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have not saved us and left us to work out this life on our own. That you have not left us to deal with issues and problems on our own strength. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that though Jesus has risen from the dead and is in heaven now, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is inside us, that you strengthen us, encourage us, not from our own strength, and when we're down and out, feeling tired and discouraged, Lord, thank you that we can look to friends that you've placed, brothers and sisters who have been saved and transformed by Christ. Lord, thank you for the knowledge that you're working across the world. Lord, thank you that you are sovereign. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to trust in you. Lord, give us strength to persevere. Thank you for the joy it is to know Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen.